stuff on your... Uh, Our pleasure. We want to do this more often, and uh, I think the uh, my our constituents deserve it. Uh, we just excuse me. Our conversation will be recorded today. But, uh, we don't have a set agenda. We have plenty of questions to ask. I'm certain, but are there things that you wanted to talk about first? Anything that you wanted to? I'll, I'll cover them in the. I'm sure we'll cover them in the questions. So why don't we just go that way? Okay. Uh, I'll start with the economy and jobs. Uh, when you were here about a year ago, I asked you to assess the state of the economy. At that time, um, your answer was essentially not good. Uh, where are we now, and what needs to be done? What we need to continue to do is, uh, bearing in mind that the Republican House is one third of the legislative process, if you take into consideration the uh, Senate being Democrat and the, the President being Democrat. Uh, I'm very anxious to hear what the President has to say about his plan to create jobs. I wish he would have called us back early and started right away. but. Uh, I still am of the belief that we have to continue to uh, cut this spending, uh, downsize the government uh, considerably, uh, rework the entire tax code. Uh, we can't piecemeal it. We have to just rework the entire tax code, and we'll get into that in, in specifics. Uh, one thing that it's uh, very crucial, I think, to getting our economy lined up is dealing with uh, China and other countries that we trade with. Uh, we talk about uh, a, a free trade. I'm talking more about a fair trade. We know that China subsidizes just about everything it produces and then floods the market with it, steals a lot of our intellectual property ideas. So we have to really take a tough stand with China. And, in, and this administration, as well as others uh, in the past, I think are afraid to do that because of the debt that China has, has, is backing for us. And, and maybe it was presumptuous of me to assume that this was the top subject that people want to talk to you about when you go to the fairs. Are they talking jobs? Or jobs. Talking? Okay. Jo first three things are jobs, jobs, and jobs. It's very clear. I mean, we had uh, a series of open houses or uh, town halls or whatever you want to call them. And yesterday there was a, a, a man who came in, uh, Democrat, he and his wife. He's been out of work for two years. And before 50 people, this guy is laying his heart out on his sleeve. Tell him, I'm a, I'm a chef, I'm a good chef. And I get a job here and this business goes out of uh, goes belly up and apply here, no calls, and it's two years, it's getting to the, he was very emotional. He had most of us in tears. Uh, and he says, I just want, I want to work. I do not want to sit home and collect unemployment. I do not want to collect welfare. I want to work and provide for, for my family. So what's your response to, to that case and cases like it in terms of job creation? Well, well first, uh, I apologized. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the entity now as a congressman and apologize that we haven't created an atmosphere uh, to the extent that we need to f for jobs to be created. Uh, there was a plant there. We expected that. Uh, we handled that. And, you know, it's like you've been in office now for eight months and you haven't created jobs and looked at this. And I said, you know something? I'm going to assume the responsibility because I'm the congressman now. But if you want to you know, set up a plant and come in here with questions, Democrats were in charge of the House for four years and along with the Senate and the presidency. And tell me how many jobs were created there other than the 120 government, 120,000 government jobs that were created. So let's, let's put this blame game aside. Uh, the debt has been accumulated over 50 years, Republican and Democrat presidents alike. Uh, we're not going to uh, eliminate it uh, overnight. There's no silver bullet, and it'll take at least a decade and maybe two if we start now to get this debt right. And I still believe that uh, we have to st Last year, the revenues in this country were $2.2 trillion. We spent almost $4 trillion. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we have to stop this spending. And if it's going to work and it's going to be effective, every single one of us, every single American is going to feel the pain. And as far as what do we do from this point with uh, the committee, 
the 12 that sit down and try to come to a resolution and then bring it back to the House and the Senate, everything has to be on the table. No one can walk in there with preconceived notions, well, we're not going to do this, or I'm not going to talk unless, we, you know, unless this is off the table. Uh, do you believe that entitlements, that is the biggest spending problem, or other spending is a problem too? Yes. Uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are consuming over 60% of our revenues. If, uh, if we are going to eliminate this debt, we have to rework the so-called entitlement system. It has to be changed. We just do not have the people paying into it. When, when Social Security was implemented in the 30s, uh, think of it as a pyramid. People on the bottom, more people were paying into it than were collecting. And the average lifespan was maybe 60, 62. Now we're into a lifespan of 80 to 90 years old. It's flipped. More people are collecting than paying into it. Uh, spending 10,000 people a day at least are signing up for Social Security and Medicare. And we just don't have the resources to keep it going. Maybe not so much some of the people in this room, but we older people, uh, the people who are collecting the Social Security now will have paid into it by the time they passed away, about $110,000 over their lifetime. But when they pass away, they will have consumed or used over $300,000 worth of Medicare. And much of that is spent in the last two years of their lives. Now, we've got to change this system to a point where uh, we can afford it. I don't think people in Social Security and Medicare now should lose anything that they paid into it, and everybody's entitled to what they paid into it, and those that are going to retire in the near future. But uh, where do we cut that off? Is it 55 years old? Is it 50 years old? And then 50, uh, below 50, there's going to be a change. Uh, we're going to have to look at uh, means testing uh, compared to income. We're going to have to look at uh, raising the retirement age, but that's a quagmire in and of itself because it's easy for me, who sits behind the desk a lot, uh, to work until I'm 70 or 75, but how about the coal miner? How about the woman who's working in a factory? It's, you know, 65, now we're gonna bump it up to 68. I saw a woman yesterday that was in the same plant that I used to work, lifting, now she was lifting 50 pound bags put him into a mixer and dumping them, 25 or 50 pound bags. But how's a 65 or a 68 year old woman supposed to do that? So just increasing the uh, age limit, uh, uh, you know, there's a downside to that too. Is the political will there right now to tackle these matters? I mean, when you talk to your colleagues, is there a sense that we're gonna get this done? Yeah, th yes, there is a sense, particularly among the, uh, the new members. Uh, we know why we were sent to Washington. We know exactly what has to be done. Uh, and we're going to have to continue to try and persuade uh, the people that have been there on both sides of the aisle. I just do not believe that uh, we can spend our way out of this. Do you think your constituents understand that? That I mean, it's, it's, it sounds, I mean, it makes sense, I understand, but when it comes to their own situation, yeah. it's going to be the pain that they're not Maybe prepare. It's a good point. Uh, let, me, let me start out by saying this. I, I've been involved in politics since I got out of law school uh, in the late 80s and a little bit actually before that. I've never seen people more engaged in the system today th than I'm seeing uh, what's happening. Out. They, uh, they are reading, uh, they are talking, they are thinking, they are asking, we get asked incredible questions. Uh, some of, them of which I don't have the answer uh, at this point, but they are more engaged. And I've had more and more people say to me, I don't mind paying more taxes as long as I know it's going to pay down the debt and it's going to be creating jobs. But I have had numerous people say to me who are on Social Security when I'd say to them, you know, say, I'm going to lose my Social Security. I said, no, you're not. What we want to do is we're going to preserve it, and so you know your children and your grandchildren, and just people coming up who have paid into it, uh, have it there also. 
And I'm amazed at some of the comments I get from some of the seniors that say, I don't care about my children, I don't care about my grandchildren, don't touch my social security. And I said, do you understand what you just said? And I'll, hear, I'll have people say to me, I want you to cut. I want you to cut like crazy in Washington. But oh, by the way, don't cut this program because uh, you know, I need it. And again, I ask, do you understand what you're saying? You want us to cut that may have an effect on someone else, but you, know, you don't want to feel the pain in this. On a similar topic, I want to ask you to clarify, uh, when you were here about a year ago, we talked about potential cuts. And of course, you're an outsider looking in at that particular point. We said, where, where do you think you might be able to identify, or what do you think are the likely areas where you would want to start? And you mentioned Department of Education, Department of Energy. Yep. A couple days later, another newspaper in the area said that you actually had proposed eliminating those departments entirely. And I just wanted to hear from you what what your thoughts are on, on that. Uh, yes, eliminate those as we know of them now. We do. I'm a states' rights guy. The less government, federal government, in our lives, the better off I think we are. Government should protect our borders, regulate our currency, protect our skies, and some you know other regulation. But uh, I still believe, uh, I'm very disappointed in the Department of Education. We've just dropped to, I think, uh, below 30 now, ranked in, in the world for our education system. We're even farther down the scale when it comes to mathematics and sciences, and I have business telling me that. We cannot hire the quality students that we need to enter the scientific field or the mathematics field. But what we're seeing is students from overseas, particularly Asia, who are coming in, going to our schools, getting a great education, they are being hired. And, and I have no uh, bias towards that, the fact, as long as they stay here. But what they're doing is staying here for a few years and taking that education and taking that experience back to, uh, to Asia. Uh, why are we 30th in the world as far as our education system when more kids are dropping out of school today than ever before? They can't, I mean, they can't even, we're finding that high school students going into college cannot even write a complete sentence. So we're pumping more and more money into a system that, that is not working. We have to stop it and start over. The same way with the Department of Energy. We were supposed to, when, when Jimmy Carter initiated that in 78, we were supposed to get off uh, our dependency on foreign oil in, in 10 years, I think he said. We're more dependent on foreign oil now than we have ever been before. So what is it doing? Well, I, I didn't, and I should have uh, done more research on it, but I assume the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I, I assume that there are important bodies that do important work are yes. up in there. So when you say eliminate them, uh, uh, eliminate uh, them as, uh, as we know them now. Uh, I think they're so far, uh, they're too far overstaffed, they're not productive, particularly in nuclear energy, but look how it stifled the, the, the nuclear energy industry. We should have more nuclear power plants. We should be developing solar energy. We should be developing wind and gas. Uh, we're still going to use and need oil, but we have enough oil and gas and coal in this country to survive on our own and to tell the, the Middle East, keep your oil, we don't need it. And I, wh why box yourself out? It'd be nice to have you know, seven or eight bullpens to go into. Uh, for the sources of energy, but we're just not developing it. Why are we not giving homeowners uh, a tax break if they're going to uh, uh, put in an alternative source of energy like wind or like solar, but we're doing it with some industries? Uh, I know I, I would love to have a, a windmill and a, and a solar panel, but I'd pay for it. I'd like to get a tax uh, credit for it by doing that. We're just not passing that down to the homeowners. I wanted to back up and uh, give you a chance to go further into detail on uh, something you mentioned at the top of the conversation, reworking the tax code. Yep. What, what, what are some of your suggestions? To eliminate the subsidies for the large, for, for example, the oil companies. Why are we subsidizing the major oil companies when they're having record-breaking uh, profits every year? Uh, the tax loopholes. Uh, you know, we're going to be better off, I believe, in uh, in our uh, bringing in revenues, uh, if we drop the corporate tax to down to say 25% and eliminate the loopholes and the subsidies, 
we're going to have more revenue generated at 25% than we are at 35%. And we can't piecemeal it. We can't do a piece here and a piece there. The tax code, all hundred and some thousand pages of it, it's absurd. I can't afford it and you can't afford to have a fleet of a tax attorneys go through it to see what every loophole we can get. You know, millionaires and billionaires and big corporations can do that. Uh, this tax structure uh, is not a fair tax structure and it's not an efficient tax structure. Uh, I'm leaning more and more towards a flat tax or something along those lines, uh, but uh, this one is just, uh, it's, it's too chaotic. When I call the IRS or get the congressional office but people in and ask them questions on tax, they said, Tom, we gotta go back and do some research or get some people that can answer this question because you know, you open one book and one paragraph will refer you to six other books and 17 other paragraphs. Come on. Uh, in your eight months, um, what have you been encouraged by? And what, if, what has made you just want to tear your hair? <laughs> the little that I have left. Uh, I'm encouraged by the, uh, uh, the drive behind the new members. We pretty much think alike. Uh, we, we, particularly in the, in the Republican House, we are very much a part of the decision making. They have to, there are 87 of us. You know, we're one third of the voting caucus. Uh, we have insisted on uh, legislation being part of the overall program, such as the last plan that was submitted, the uh, balanced budget amendment. It was, was one that was not going to be added, and, we, and, and the reason why it wasn't going to be added to the plan was you know, the Senate will never vote for it. Well, you know, some, I do care about if the Senate votes for it, but let's throw it over on their lap. You know, uh, well, it'll break the deal. Well, then if it breaks the deal, it breaks the deal. But this is we have to work under a balanced budget amendment different from the legislation that we've had over the years where we have legislated in the House and in the Senate not to go above a certain amount and when it's inconvenient for us we just waive it and we've done it over 700 times. If it's a balanced budget amendment it's constitutional one can be impeached for not following through with what the Constitution says. Uh, what, what is frustrating is the, the partisan bickering uh, the worried about being reelected as opposed to worried about getting the country back on its financial feet again. I was in uh, riding the, the train over to the house and I usually walk but the guy I was with had some surgery so we got on a car and, and a ranking a member of the other side of the aisle got on and looked at me and said you guys have your work cut out for you and I said well what do you mean? He said, well, you're in the majority if you have the work to do. I said, I think we all have the work to do. The person said, no, we're on the other side. If you vote yes, we vote no. If you vote no, we vote yes. And, then, and, we have to, and that's our way of getting the power back. Now, that kind of thinking, uh, the person shouldn't be there. And that's why I'm a firm believer in term limits. I guess the logical follow-up, what would, the, what would the term be that you think would be appropriate for how many years? Well, per, uh, pursuant to our Constitution, the President can serve two terms or ten years. You know, if a President takes over, if dies and, and takes over in less than two years. Uh, senator's term is six years. So two years, two terms for a Senator, twelve years, five or six terms for a Congressman because a term is two years, so around that ten or twelve year mark. And then somebody moves in. I would like to see the president serve one six year term. Because I don't think there's ever been a president the day after he has won election not concerned about getting reelected. And uh, the debt ceiling resolution democracy working, democracy not working? What was your take on what happened? I think it was. Uh, uh, democracy working to a point, but still the politics, the vitriol in, in the political arena is, is, uh, is painful. I voted to increase the debt ceiling and uh, was right up until the last minute, just did not want to do it. But the people with whom I spoke, uh, the research that I've done, 
the constituents with whom I talked to. My concern wasn't S&P or any other financial institution is downgrading us. I think uh, S&P has blown it in the past, uh, that, that's obvious. Uh, I think it was just somebody's uh, 15 minutes of fame uh, to, to get into the media. And going from a triple A to a double A plus is like going from red to magenta. And you didn't hear any other finance, uh, institutions downgrade us. I think that was uh, irresponsible uh, for them to do that, just like I think it was irresponsible who, who was it, uh, who was the billionaire. It was Buffett said he pays less taxes than his secretary. Uh, I think that was irresponsible and that was uncalled for. And his secretary is probably making six figures anyhow. But uh, you know why, why, why rub salt uh, into the wound? So I voted for it because of this. Uh, from all my research and talking to financial experts, I was afraid the interest rates were going to go up and they agreed with me. Many people are still on a variable mortgage that was going to go up. Credit cards were going up, auto loans, uh, and the businesses, particularly the small businesses who borrow money every 90 or 180 days, that interest rate was going up. And it's proved, uh, I think I was proved right on there, it didn't go up, which it was suggested that it would be if we didn't pay our bills. And again, I think it was irresponsible for uh, the, uh, the president to get on television and tell the seniors they may not get their checks. That's absurd, that's outrageous, and he should be embarrassed uh, to get up there and make a political statement like that. He knows, and now the American people know, that the President and the Secretary of Treasury determine what bills are to be paid. It's up to them. And I challenged the President when, the, when 20 of the freshman members went to the White House because he didn't respond to our letter, so we hand-carried it to the front gate. Uh, he, the secret, he made the Secret Service to the police make us get off the sidewalk where we had to stand in the street, but we did that. And we said to him, uh, you know, and, and I summed up, I was the last one to speak and I double dared him to even think about not sending social security checks out and not paying the military. Because we had the revenues to pay social security, the military, to pay the debt and other bills. But we didn't have 40% of the revenue that we needed to keep agencies operating, uh, to keep contracts going. And there are many people out there that said to me, let the government shut down. Well, that's real easy to say. Uh, take a look at what happened in the 90s when that occurred. Plus, the same individual that would say to me, shut the government down, if that person needed a passport or wanted to go sign up for Social Security and no one was in the office or they took a vacation to the state, to the federal parks and saw closed, you can't get in. or the, if we had to shut down, even the contracts that would have to be reworked would have cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. So there, if, if there's any business, this is not a black and white business. And there's no silver bullet here. And as I said, it took us 50 years to get to the $15 trillion of debt that we're in, Republicans and Democrats alike. It's going to take us two decades to get out of it, but we have to start now. In making your decision on that matter in particular, you said you, there are people that you talk to in the financial end. Who yeah. do you go to for for advice? Uh, I have uh, historically you've known, or now that you're in a different position, you can pick up the phone and call someone. Actually, both okay. uh, economists, uh, professors from college, uh, people that I know that are in the banking and finance industry. I've become uh, friends with Dick Morris. Uh, I'm doing a little uh, back and forth email uh, with Charles Krauthammer, uh, talking to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to get their input and, and, where, and where they see this thing headed. Uh, so it's nothing that it's, uh, you know, I just don't make this snap decision. I put a lot of time and effort and thought into it and make the decision that I think is, is best for the country. Talk about you know, talking to people on the other side of the aisle, and you had a story earlier where it's a yes or a no. Yeah. So there are some people that will reach across the aisle? Yes. Yeah, there's, there is a handful of individuals uh, who I've come to know, uh, fiscally conservative individuals that realize that the spending has to stop. But uh, to be honest, they're in a little bit of a precarious situation because uh, we don't, Boehner doesn't say to us, or Cantor doesn't say to us, vote this way or else. That hasn't been said to us. 
Uh, I don't think it will, maybe because of the numbers of us, but, but who knows, but Boehner's been straight with us and we've participated. But I've had colleagues on the other side of the aisle say, if I don't vote this way, I will be removed from this committee. I've been point blank told, I will be removed. You'll lose your chairmanship. Uh, you're not gonna get uh, uh, financial backing when it comes time to run again. The, the, I, the, what I hear from people is, is a frustration with the politics of Washington, Harrisburg, sure. in general, yeah. is that they're tired of the bickering that, yeah. that compromise should be part of the process. I, I agree with you, but I'm going to come to our defense here a little bit. Uh, you know, the Republicans put four plans out on the table. Uh, the Ryan plan, two of the Boehner plans, and then finally the combination where, where, where they got together. Uh, we, hadn't, we didn't get anything from the Democrats, nothing. And Nancy Pelosi, she had control in 2010. She didn't even put a 2011 budget together because of an election coming up. It was quite clear the Democrats would say that. We, well, she didn't want a budget to vote on it because we had an election coming up. She thought it, we could lose the election by that. Well, she had her eye on the wrong ball, number one. Uh, Harry Reid hasn't passed a budget since April of 2009. So we are trying. Harry Reid doesn't want any votes because of the election next year. 33 of the senators that are up, 23 of them are Democrats. And he doesn't want a voting record. We, we voted uh, in the House to pass the, the cut cap and balance. We went over there, walked over to the Senate, and tried to persuade the Democrats to vote for it. what he do? He tabled it. He took a vote on tabling it. That's totally irresponsible. Put it on the floor for a vote and then see how it goes, but don't, don't block it. And this idea of one person being able to prevent something from being on the floor is preposterous as far as I'm concerned. So we are trying. The, the president didn't put a budget forward until uh, the last moment he threw something together and it didn't even pass in the House, 97 zip. What does that say about how much thought went into that budget? So we are trying in the Republican House and we don't have all the answers, and it's not perfect. But at least come back with us, to us with something other than we want $2.2 trillion, and that's the end of it with no cuts. Or with a, two, with a $15 trillion debt and a $2.2 trillion uh, blank check, we'll cut $300 billion over 10 years. That's absurd. Put this in the context of a person making, a family making $50,000 a year. That family, to put it in relationship, I wish I would have brought the chart, so I'm trying to remember the figures, but that's like they're spending $75,000 a year, and they have a debt of $150,000 a year previous, and they're paying $300 a month on an interest, uh, just on the interest alone, not on the principal, that doesn't even cover the interest payment. So in the end of 10 years, they're up like a half a million dollars in debt. That's the way the government is operating. You know, the federal government's great for having a budget with no money. And one of my proposals is every percentage point that that debt increases from year to year, they should cut the elected officials' wages by that percentage as well. And then you're going to see some people step up at the plate and say, oh, geez, this is going to come out of my pocket now, so maybe we better get serious here. So I don't want to make this political, folks, but we have been trying in the House. Don't forget, we're only one half of one third of the government. And the Republicans had control in the 60s, and I'm very just in, in, the, in the 90s, and I'm very disappointed in the spending that took place there, and I'm very disappointed in the spending that, that Bush did. But every president since about the 60s, or at least the 70s, has doubled the debt under their watch, except for Jimmy Carter. Now, he's increased the debt, but every president's almost doubled. And I'll, I'll start with, uh, I think when, when uh, Bush took over, one took over from Reagan, the debt was about, a trillion, a little over a trillion. Uh, when uh, Clinton left office, no, excuse me, it was two and a half trillion. When Clinton left office, it was uh, about five trillion. When Bush two left office, it was almost 10 trillion. And 18 months into his presidency, it went up to 14.2 trillion under Obama. 
And I'm tired of hearing from anybody, particularly the president, well, I inherited this. Look, you're a big boy now. You knew what you were getting into. You told the American people what you were going to do. You weren't able to do it. Be man enough to step up to the plate and say, this isn't working. We have to try something else. I don't throw the blame on the previous Congress. I knew what the debt was. I knew what the responsibility was. And now it's squarely, I'm one of the 435 in Congress. It's squarely on my shoulders. I've got to try and do something about it and not complain about it. Matt, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, FEMA. Yeah. Um, specific, well, first of all, I guess uh, I'll just give you the chance to generally address um, what are you doing and what do you think needs to be done um, to help clean up this region after uh, the, the disaster this weekend? I, I think the, uh, the governments, uh, the federal government and the state government, along with the locals, did well. Uh, uh, they saw this one coming. They learned from what happened in the past. So I give credit to the governor and I give credit to FEMA, who they were out there. I am, I'm on Homeland Security and I'm on a subcommittee for uh, emergency preparedness in the communities. Uh, I've been on the phone for the past two days with the uh, deputy directors of FEMA who have been responding to my questions. Over the, f I don't have to put a letter together. I'm on the phone telling them what I'm seeing as I'm in the chopper flying with the governor, looking down or on the ground, seeing a bridge out, and they're saying, "Okay, Tom, we got it. We got it. We're taking it down." There was a little hang up on whether the president was going to sign it. I found out very late last night that he changed his mind and did decide to sign uh, the uh, request for the uh, short-term emergency. Uh, damage that has to be taken care of and then once that gets kicked into gear which it is as we speak then we'll address the long-term issues but I have nothing but uh, compliments for the way this was handled uh, all up and down the chain okay um, kind of on that same subject uh, that uh, I mean obviously there's gonna have to be some commitment from FEMA to come in here and yeah. uh, help clean this up. Um, but you're talking about, you know, balance, uh, balancing the budget and whatnot. I mean, sure. Where does that money um, come from? Um, are we gonna can FEMA just run up a, a bill and we'll pay for it as a one time expense or is that are there gonna have to be cuts to balance that? Uh, FEMA has about as I think today I was notified that they have about eight hundred billion dollars. Yeah. Don't quote me on that figure. I'm not sure if it was 800 billion or 800 million. I, I think I have. I believe it's 800 million. 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 That's what I was afraid of. 800 million dollars isn't going to go far among six or seven states in the damage that has been done. Uh, the federal government's going to have to come up with the money that needs to be uh, for the, that addresses the short-term problems. Uh, we, we, we're going to have to stop dealing with the long-term problems of rebuilding areas that are going to take years to rebuild because we have people that are displaced, we have people that don't have electricity, they don't have running water. We've got to get that taken care of. We've got to get the bridges and the roads fixed so you can cross. Uh, I stood, and I don't know how, before how many bridges uh, yesterday, uh, waving to the guy on the other side but couldn't get across. And the roads, it's just absolutely amazing what water can do to the roads. You figure out the road's 18 feet wide. Well, the water cuts through it like a hot knife through, uh, through butter. And maybe three feet of that road is there. You can't even ride a bicycle on it. But we just can't print money to do this. We have to offset this by responsible cuts. It's just that we're not smart enough, uh, and we haven't learned over the years, that we need to build a reserve. Just you know, when you when you say the reserve or, or put money in the bank for a rainy day, people in Washington look at you as if you're crazy. Uh, hopefully, we're, we're learning from this, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to address all the issues at once because we don't have the money to do it. And this is just one of many billion-dollar disasters or that we've had in the last in this year. I sure, think. right. So, any thoughts? Well, the cuts would be part of a bigger picture. Yes. Um, what specifically um, would you like to see cut to? Where would you like to see that money come from? For the I mean, would it come from the 
come out of you know other parts of FEMA's budget, but it comes just from the No, it's going to have to come from across the board. Everything is on the table. And one of the areas where we have to start is downsizing the government. You know, I haven't seen anybody in Washington uh, taken out of their office in an ambulance to a hospital that's been overworked. And just like we do in industry and probably just like you do here, when the revenues are down, you cut where you can cut. And if the revenues still aren't increasing, uh, you don't fill positions. And if the revenues still don't increase, you have to lay some people off. I don't want to see people laid off, but we can downsize Washington just through attrition in and of itself. When I was in private practice, we had one secretary handle two and sometimes three attorneys. When I go into these agencies, I see two and three and four secretaries you know, responding to, reporting to one assistant director or a deputy director or, or a secretary. Uh, you know, there are way too many people in Washington and it's going to have to learn to do uh, more work with fewer people. Back to the, the uh, to FEMA, does the short-term recovery, the money that's applied, will that be something that can be used to build a bridge or repair a road? That is my interpretation. I'm waiting to see what the actual uh, document says as to what can happen with that money. I think initially it's getting people that are displaced into uh, secure housing and uh, getting the electricity and the water up and running. But I can't imagine anything else being uh, more important after that than getting the bridges and the roads squared away so people can get to where they're going, get to work, uh, goods being transported back and forth. I'm not sure if you have any answers, but when you get, they get to secure housing, it might not be their own house. And you're right, it may not be their own house at, the, at this point. Because that's what they're going to ask, who is the story tomorrow? What does he mean by that? Well, I'm not sure that we have yeah. the answer, but so get them stabilized, but not necessarily in their own house, right. and maybe repair bridges and roads. Right. We should let them get to fix their own house, but maybe not have the money for it. You know, I'd love to see everybody back in their own home, but some of the damage is so devastating. We just we uh, it, this has to be clearly watched line by line, item by item, priority by priority. Uh, and that's beyond Pennsylvania too. Right. Well oh my gosh, goodness, you yeah, look at Vermont. Is, is it Vermont that I was comparing to? Pennsylvania was hit hard. There were areas, other areas hit harder. More questions on the storm? Um, there was a, I, I only heard it on the radio, so I don't have all the details, but there was an argument about, or an argument for um, weather buoys, and they were going to lose their funding and it would it would impact being able to, to navigation for ships and weather forecasting and their arguments, some cuts are, some things are more important than others when it comes to cuts. And mm -hmm. Whether there would be a, uh, an educated approach to this or a, a balanced approach. Because, of course, if we weren't prepared, our damage here would have been that much worse. That's right. Now, you, you bring up a very good point. Educated cuts. Uh, educated cuts to the point where we have to weigh it out financially. And then again, I don't think it, take, it takes a rocket scientist to figure this out. Let's use your example of the weather bully. Uh, if we have a, a device that's going to warn us so we can take the necessary steps that we should be taking or we have taken, at least that we did this time, uh, maybe instead of having $15 billion of damage, if we didn't have those devices, we would have $30 billion of damage. So it, it's all cost related. So. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to support uh, that device that, not even in the long run, probably in the short run, is going to save us money. It's not going to eliminate expenses that we have during a catastrophe such as we had, but it's the, it's the smart thing to do. It's like saying uh, in, in, a, in a building, well, you know something, we haven't had a fire in here since we've been in existence, so there's no real reason to fix uh, the fire alarm system because we haven't used it. But you know darn well, as soon as it's not replaced, something's going to happen and somebody's going to lose, lose their life over it. Here's the, and this is the challenge for you, I guess, if you're going to get into, is that the people in Knox or wherever don't get everything back the way it was. It doesn't get rebuilt, so we don't get the entire funding. Yet we'll have money for weather balloons. That helps them down the road in a way they may not realize but they're gonna, that gets politicized. That becomes, and, and for, yeah. it becomes 
misinterpreted, whatever happens. Sure. And how do you go to your constituents and say, this is, what's, what, what, how do you approach that? Where, how do you approach that uh, discussion as to, this is why we support lobster fishermen, or why I, it all becomes politicized at the end when it comes time to the election, but you, you're trying to make the right decision. Right, and I would do it just by the example, uh, and I have done it, just by the example that I gave to you about you know, having you know, the fire warning system. Uh, we want to put everybody back to the position they were prior to uh, the storm. Uh, but it's going to take time to do that. And I know this is, uh, people don't have much trust in the government at this point. But we also have to be looking down the road, uh, not only reactive, but we have to be proactive. And we can't let our guard down uh, because someone says, well, you know, the, the, this room on my house, this part of the roof is leaking and I want a new roof on it. Uh, right now we just may be able to have to cover it with tarp so it keeps the water out and we'll get to the new roof down the road. But we also have to maintain that system that's going to warn us again uh, when a storm comes where you're not in your house when the roof falls in. We have to stop being selfish. You know, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's entitlements. I want my entitlements. I want what I'm due. Uh, I want the rich people, I don't have any money, so the rich people should give me some of theirs. I'm not responsible for the way my kid acts in school. You're the teacher, you take care of it. I don't have to take care of the, of the uh, I, uh, to the three or four illegitimate kids that I have. It's not my problem anymore, I left. Uh, I've had people say that uh, uh, Move On had three or four people come uh, to my, one of my offices while I was in another office and they knew where I was and protests were the jobs. You know, you've been in office eight months. You know, people can see through that, that ridiculous uh, politicizing. Uh, but I wish I were there because I wanted to pull out the newspaper because that night I looked into it in my coming county in the Williamsport Sun Gazette, there were 30 jobs looking for people. People were looking to fill 30 jobs. Now I've had a guy uh, from the employment office tell me that they offered a person a job that make uh, and that pays fifteen fifty an hour. He didn't take it because he was used to making twenty five dollars an hour and he said he could make fifteen dollars an hour by sitting home doing nothing. Now my question is why is that person still on unemployment number one and just think of what that person said. Uh, we're complaining about the illegals in this country, and I complain too. We have to protect our borders, and anybody who's here should be here legally. But try to get somebody to go pick tomatoes on a farm and try to get somebody to clean the, the bathrooms at a hotel. We just can't seem to do it because apparently those types of jobs are beneath us here in the United States. So we have to become more responsible and start thinking of the country as a whole than thinking of I or me. And it's got to start right in Washington because there are too many people worried about getting reelected as opposed to doing what should be done. I hope I'm answering your questions. Matt, did you want to stick on storms or? Um, on, I have one last question on storms. Uh, I, this, this is a story that's from the AP today about um, response to the storms. And, uh, it, it mentions that in the upcoming FEMA budget, um, Disaster rate was increased by 2.6 billion, but it was up, offset with cuts elsewhere, uh, particularly to homeland security um, training for firefighters and uh, police personnel um, to prepare for disasters mm -hmm. like this. Is what do you think of, of that of cutting that sort of program? Is that kind of on the same level as those weather balloons? Is that something that you would disagree with because it's a kind of Thing could save his money in the long run. Look, I've been in law enforcement for 18 years. I work closely with the police as, a, as, a, as an assistant DA, a DA, U.S. attorney, and we always want to have more and more and more training. Uh, but there gets to a point where, uh, you know, where's the where's the bang for the buck? Uh, we know something. When, when police and emergency personnel get through their basic training, uh, whether it's becoming a police officer or an EMT uh, or a paramedic, they know what to do and they know what has to be done. Uh, 
Sure, if we have the resources and some new mm -hmm. technology comes out, uh, then, we, uh, then we train or additionally train or retrain our people. But uh, it boils down to we have to do, we have to base our economy and the way we do business on the money that we have to spend. And I'd love to see everybody go to college free and uh, get free health care. And as I said before, let's throw in a new house. But you know something? We just don't have the money. And if and until we do, we need to take care of the very, very basic prioritized issues. And then once we prove that we're responsible with the dollar and at least become 70% efficient in, uh, in DC and in, in the state house, uh, then we can start talking about expanding on what we can do uh, to improve the quality of life for us. 70% efficient? How efficient are we now in Washington? We be in Washington. This is just something off the top of my head in, in, in eight months that, uh, that I've looked at. And uh, we're, we're lucky if we're at the 50% efficient mark. Uh, with the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of September 11th approaching, there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion about Department of Homeland Security. Uh, is that department bloated? Is that an area that, that uh, can be cut significantly? I mean, I, I, I think shortly after the incident, a place like Wellsboro was getting money to protect the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, which is essentially a hole in the ground. And that was pre-natural gas drilling, so there weren't a lot of people there on day. You know something, you've just summed it up beautifully and we can stop the interview right now because that's the point, these are the types of points I'm trying to, to get across and, and you raise it perfectly. Uh, but I'm sorry I interrupted you, go ahead. Is the department still, is the department loaded today? I think every department in Washington, D.C. is bloated. And you know something, we reacted to uh, the worst devastation to this country since the Civil War, I think, on, on our land. And we have probably had a tendency to overreact. But given the circumstances, I'm not blaming anyone for that. But uh, there isn't an agency in Washington that can't be streamlined and cut and cut to a great extent. But think about this, we had two of the best entities to, if not take control, assist in Homeland Security, and we, have, we didn't utilize them, I think, to the point we should. The military and the Department of Justice. Who's gonna provide better security to this country than our military? And then people will ask me, I'm going to f just flip here for a moment for an example. People ask me about the war, should we be in, should we be out? We're there. That's all there's to it. Whether we should be there, I don't necessarily, whether we, we should have gone into this, uh, I, for one, was not 100% sold on it. If we were going to do something, we should have done something with the, with the thorn in the side and the nemesis who's over there, which is Iran, but we didn't. We chose, and that's the con that'll be a discussion for another day. Uh, uh, but uh, on, on that subject, we shouldn't have been in, in either Iraq or Iraq. I'm not sure of that. You know, so I, I just, I didn't, uh, I didn't like the idea of going into uh, 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 Iraq uh, and then Afghanistan I did for, uh, not primarily for uh, financial reasons, which is a big factor, but it's easy to say, let's put an exit plan together uh, on how we're going to get out of a war, but we don't know what we're in for until we get into it. My problem with that is, did we take into consideration the uh, the ideology, the mindset of the people in that region? I had a college professor who told me a long, long time ago, never ever get involved in another country's civil war unless it is a direct threat on to the United States. And uh, we probably should pay more attention to that because our idea of democracy may not be another people's idea of democracy. The war's costing us a lot of money. And really what brought this home to me is when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan a few months ago, uh, I was uh, in a, at the base in Afghanistan and the day before, two days before, 
two young soldiers in their 20s were killed. And I took part in the ramp ceremony where they brought them each in on a Humvee and we escorted those coffins up into the plane to ship home, to send home, I shouldn't say ship, to send home to their families and leaning at those, kneeling at those coffins inside that plane, knowing that those two men were, had a wife and small children at home. And I'm saying to myself, is this worth it? Is this worth it one more time for an American to come home in a body bag? And with all due respect to every nationality, to every country, the Middle East, the people have been killing each other for the last 5,000 years over religion. And I think unless there's a divine intervention, they're going to be killing each other over the next 5,000 years over religion. If there, there was a direct threat on the United States if you, look at, if you consider Afghanistan the launching point. If there were a direct threat to well, us. 9-11. Yeah. 3,000 dead. Yeah. But then again, Afghanistan, the history of that goes, no one's... When you learn from, when you learn from England, the English, when you learn from the Russians, what were we going to do differently? You know, Afghanistan is so... Uh, so archaic. I mean, I was there. I spent days on the ground and in the air and on where, where we train. And it reminds me when I see pictures of the moon with a few blown up shacks on it. Uh, they are just uh, people in this country have no idea what other people around the world how they live and what they do not have. Uh, the shacks that they live in, uh, the no plumbing, uh, they have to go miles to, to, to get their water, no medical coverage of what we think medical coverage should be. Uh, I'm going to switch gears if I may. Uh, when you visited with us uh, a year ago, you declined to answer a couple questions uh, during the build-up to the election, saying that after the election you were comfortable talking about it. Uh, one of those questions was in regards to your relationship when you were district attorney uh, an acquaintance of yours who owned a car dealership, uh, on his behalf, he filed some paperwork to have a, a charge expunged. Can you talk to us more about that at this particular point? And that is simply not true. I never filed any paperwork to have a charge expunged. I was asked for my recommendation or, or my uh, uh, thought on uh, should it proceed and uh, should it not proceed. and. Uh, I simply said I have no objection uh, to what has been done in the past. It's up to the court. Uh, the defense attorneys uh, submit those documents. They hand it to the court, and the courts make the decisions. So again, that was a that was uh, something that was uh, uh, politically motivated uh, to make it look uh, like I was doing something illegal and unethical. And obviously, that wasn't the case. Uh, as I understand it. There was contact with one judge on this issue, and when the matter was kind of turned down or, or rejected, then you contacted another judge. Is that accurate? No, that is not accurate. I did, I'm not contacting any judge. The paperwork is submitted. Other questions? Are you going to run again? Yes. costs, but then we look at some of, to use you as an example, some of your activities in terms of traveling overseas. And then when you add up the number of representatives, the number of senators who may be traveling, what is, what is the value of that? I am on two committees that involve uh, uh, travel, uh, a great deal of travel, even travel that I've declined. Uh, it's tiresome. It's, it's, a, it's a long trip. It's not a vacation. I'm on Homeland Security and I'm on Foreign Affairs. And the, tr uh, the trips that I took to Afghanistan and Iraq speak for themselves, seeing what the troops are doing, talking to the military personnel. I took an economic uh, summit to, uh, several months ago to Europe and visited several countries, including Russia. Uh, talking to the leaders in those countries and the business people from their perspective of, of what they're faced with, how much they rely on what we do in this country. And uh, I don't take anyone with me. Uh, so it's just myself. And uh, the last trip to Israel was, again, uh, uh, a trip that I learned a great deal about as to what 
the Israeli people are faced with. Uh, you have no concept of, you know, we know the area is a, a small area, but Israel is such a tiny country surrounded by hostile uh, neighbors. And, you know, they, they start teaching their children as soon as they can understand what the parents are saying, that when this siren blows, you have 15 seconds to get to safety because of these rockets that are coming in uh, from Palestine. No, it opened my eyes a great deal as to what they're exposed to. I can stand in Jerusalem and see Bethlehem. Uh, you can stand on, you know, Palestine. We, the buffered zone isn't there like we have just in the state of Pennsylvania. You know, where we're at, we can't see another uh, border. You can look several hundred yards away, a couple of miles, and you can see the the border of a hostile country. So there is an advantage you feel to to. With, even with all the communication available to us today, do you think it's important to, to make those trips? Sure, because I learned what, what came to, uh, what brought it all together for me was how close uh, Israel is to uh, the people who want to destroy them. Just to, to run out of a, a cave and shoot a rocket over that cost $200 to make from a shoulder weapon that can kill. Look, we were only 30 miles north of when the seven people got killed uh, in the south of Israel because of a rocket that was launched over. So it gave me a real down-to-earth perspective of uh, how dangerous it is over there, what they're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis, but the resilience that those people have. And even when we met with Netanyahu, we made it very clear, I want to, I want peace. And I will gladly hand over land in exchange for peace. But that land wasn't taken just for the sake of taking land. It was a buffer zone that was needed to keep the enemy at least farther away than what they were. And he's taken a lot of heat, not only from his own party, but from the Israeli people. No, we don't want to return any land. But he's willing to say, We'll return it, but just give us peace. But when you have the leaders of Palestine saying, number one, we don't want to talk to you. Number two, you hand the land over, then we'll talk to you as to whether we're going to continue a war with you, not to mention the relationship with Hamas. So how do you negotiate with someone like that? Right. Just to be clear, so these, the trips have value and worth the, the expense because they better inform you and you think you make better decisions for the United States. Yes, sir. Yep. And to bring home and explain to my constituents uh, what we're faced with over there and what important role the United States has uh, with our allies. I mean, we're, you know, we don't have a closer ally than Israel there. I think we're just as close to Israel as they are, as, as they are to us. Uh, it's a terrible way to live. When I'm walking around over there, I mean, we, we went to Palestine and talk and, and we spoke with the, uh, in fact he came to see us, the, the, prime, the prime minister of Palestine who has a little more open-minded, wants to talk, wants to settle something. He doesn't have the, the power base back in Palestine. The president does. The president doesn't want to have a discussion with Netanyahu. And I was concerned, you know, we're walking around uh, places in Jerusalem and uh, all in Israel and you know there's always in the back of your mind is that mortar, is that rocket going to come flying in near us? Can, can you explain why with so many uh, problems, economic problems we have here in our own country, why we would continue to send money overseas uh, to countries not our own? Yeah. Where, where most people from the United States will never visit. Right, and, and uh, we, can't, we cannot continue to do that for the most part. We're sending money to countries that don't even like us. And I was simply told by the Secretary of State when I questioned her in a hearing about that is, well, we have to keep the door open. Uh, I don't think that's working too well, to tell you the truth. Uh, my grandmother used to say, we need to take care of ourselves at home. And then once we get our own affairs in order, then we can help others. We're going to have to significantly cut back. Uh, but we also have to be there for our allies. Any other questions from the group? Um, going back to the start of thing, um, could you say, go into a little bit more detail about, um, you said that you were on a helicopter uh, with the governor. Yes. Is that right? Um, have you been going around meeting with 
constituents um, identifying problems? I mean, could you speak to a little bit more of you know what you meant? Sure. Uh, we were all over Wyoming County uh, Luzerne. and Luzerne. In uh, two major concerns that people had, uh, actually three, uh, those that were displaced, uh, when can I get back into my house? And when are you going to get electricity turned on? And when can I assume that I'm going to be able to have fresh water? And those issues uh, were being taken care of rather readily uh, the day we were there and, and uh, yesterday. Yeah. And they're still working. I still have staff members that are out helping delivering water to people to make sure they have fresh, clean water. The electric companies are working 24-7 to, to get the electricity restored. And then uh, I really haven't heard anybody complain to the extent of, uh, I need my house rebuilt. That's really not, I'm sure it's in their mind, but they know that many people are suffering. Uh, and we'll get to the issue of, okay, how are there, are there going to be funds to take care of, of my house if I don't have insurance? Is, is PEMA going to kick in? Is FEMA going to kick in? Uh, be there on Monday or Tuesday? Uh, what's today? Today Wednesday? Wednesday? Monday, Monday and Tuesday. Monday, yeah. Two days. Monday was the flyover with yeah. the governor. Yeah. And then Tuesday? And we did, we did some driving around and then some yesterday. Have a staff member who's out today with um, yeah to distributing water, going door to door, checking to see uh, on people, if particularly those that were living alone or, or live out, you know, out you know, in the country a ways. Where were you during the storm, Little League? Uh, actually, I was at my house, and then uh, went to the Little League World Series game, and it started looking pretty dismal there, and people started leaving, but. Then for some reason it cleared up almost as, as fast as it came in. Do you have any ceremonial duties this year at Little League? No. no. I got to watch. <laughs> okay. Got to watch. Uh, anything that we didn't ask you about that you particularly want to mention or did we cover that? <laughs> Uh, we're doing a, uh, a lot of outreach. Uh, I want people to make sure that if they need something to call our offices, uh, not only in D.C., but Tunkhannock and Williamsport and Sunbury. We're doing a lot of tele-town hall conference calls where I can really get to talk to a lot of people at once. We send out a notice the day before and tell them that uh, if they want to call in, here's the number. They call in. I'm on the phone live. Of course, we can't get to everyone, but people we take the calls in the order they came in. They come in, anybody, it's just now Republican, it's Republican, Democrat, independent people who, uh, who want to ask questions. We're doing a lot of uh, uh, open houses, uh, meet and greets, uh, getting out with the media, uh, explaining what's been going on, what we hope will continue to go on, how we try, we're, we're hoping to make changes, and we're hoping to create jobs. Uh, someone. Uh, who wasn't pleased with my politics argued that the only one that can create jobs is the government, and I don't believe that. Uh, Have you faced any significant uh, problems holding town, hall town halls? No, there was uh, um, some move on people, not even from the area, uh, in the Sunbury area. Uh, they were there, but, and, and one of them said, you know, our mission is to disrupt, uh, but I know how to handle it. I uh, give the person, look, you can say what you want, you can ask a question, you can call me names, leave my family out of it, and you have two minutes to do that. And if they don't stop in two minutes, then I just I ignore them, and I go on to the next person. And that pretty much uh, curtails it. There was a person that had a camera that thought they were hiding it, and I said, you don't need to hide your camera and your recording device take it out here and I have nothing to hide. So it's clearly a disruptive move, but by and large, uh, the groups have been, well, 99%, they have been respectful. And I said, you treat each other with respect, you voice your opinion, uh, you don't try to intimidate or, or belittle somebody, and I'm gonna listen to you. If you do what I just recited, I'm not gonna listen to you. Have you heard what might happen to you? The 10th district as far as how much you shaped? I hear rumors uh, almost weekly. Uh, 
you know, we're, because of our population dropping, we're going to lose a seat. Uh, I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that since the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the governor in Harrisburg, it, 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 it could very well be a Democrat seat. And uh, as far as the redistricting, I've heard that I could go as far as south as Harrisburg, which is a little surprising to me. I could go as far as west as uh, uh, Center County, and I could go even uh, uh, farther east, southeast, uh, along New York and, and New Jersey. So that's a possibility as well, uh, picking up other areas like Cumming County and, and maybe Tioga, but you know something? It's up to the state. Uh, they're not going to listen to me. <laughs> and I'm sure they're, uh, uh, they're not going to listen to uh, anyone else who says how they're going to draw these lines, particularly people in Washington. I mean, they're drawing maps in Washington for my district. I don't know if I think the people who are drawing the maps have ever even been to my district, so how would they know how it's going to go? Bring to the fair. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Thank right. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Sure.